with um, glycolysis in that it requires a regeneration of the oxidized NAD. And so he said the solution to this problem was fermentation, right? We talked about lactic acid fermentation, alcoholic fermentation. Uh, we talked about um, a description of fermentation, the partial oxidation of glucose. We have an internal organic molecule acts as a terminal electron acceptor. In lactic acid fermentation, it's pyruvic acid. In alcoholic fermentation, it's that intermediate acid aldehyde, which you didn't have to remember. Um, it's an anaerobic process. It doesn't require an electron transport chain. If we're talking about fermentation beginning with one glucose, the net profit for the cell is 2 ATP per glucose um, by substrate level phosphorylation. The acids and alcohols, which are the typical fermentation products, they still have lots of high energy electrons, so we say it's wasteful. And also we want to remember that those high energy electrons, they can be um, toxic at high levels. Right. And then we talked about different fermentation pathways. They, um, we said the ones you need to know for lecture exam two are lactic acid fermentation and alcoholic fermentation. Right. We talked about all the uses of fermentation. Um, we'll be detecting fermentation in lab, doing our metabolic biochemical tests. And again, folks, um, we, we were saying there was a problem with fermentation because it's wasteful. The end products are still energy rich. They have lots of high energy electrons. And the end products are um, toxic, the acids and alcohols. So we suggested that after life had been fermenting for a long time, um, there was a food shortage. So there was natural selection for mutants that had a more efficient way of making more ATP per glucose and a process in which the end products were not so toxic. And so these mutants evolve aerobic respiration. Now what I'm going to do, folks, is I'm going to um, skip the next few slides. Um, this was how we also did it in lecture. We skipped these next few slides that have the kind of the key events of aerobic respiration. It was discussion of the electron transport chain, producing a proton gradient, and then ATP synthase using the proton gradient to drive ATP synthesis. And, and in lecture, folks, we skipped to slide um, 20 and 21 because we wanted to know what events preceded the evolution of aerobic respiration. And the big event was the evolution of porphyrin rings. And you might recall, folks, that the evolution of porphyrin rings were had a huge impact on the evolution of life. And I'm going to back up one slide, you guys, because it has a text. But you recall with the evolution of porphyrin rings, it permitted evolution of photosynthetic pigments, bacteria chlorophyll, which permitted anoxygenic photosynthesis, and then subsequently chlorophyll A, which permitted oxygenic photosynthesis, and that's what changed Earth's atmosphere from anaerobic to aerobic. And so the, our, currently in our modern atmosphere, we have about 21% um, molecular oxygen. So that was a big event. And furthermore, the porphyrin rings permitted evolution of cytochromes. And cytochromes are essential parts of electron transport chains, which are essential for cellular respiration. So again, the porphyrin rings permitted evolution of the electron transport chain. Um, initially, that permitted evolution of a process called anaerobic respiration and then eventually aerobic respiration. So we could say that aerobic respiration evolved um, with the help of the porphyrin rings. So now folks, um, uh, part two of PowerPoint B was gonna be a discussion of aerobic respiration. Remember, this is the redox reaction you wanna remember. Um, you'll be asked to write this redox reaction for the complete oxidation of glucose by um, aerobic respiration. Our reactants, our high energy electrons are carried by glucose. Um, oxygen is gonna be the terminal electron acceptor. This arrow represents all the steps involved in aerobic respiration. When glucose is oxidized, when we stripped off all the high energy electrons, we'll end up with the oxidized form, um, carbon dioxide. When water accepts, excuse me, I misspoke, you guys, sorry. When oxygen accepts the electrons at the end of the electron transport chain, oxygen will be reduced to water. The reason the cell is doing this is to release large amounts of energy. And the energy will be used to make, hypothetically, 36 to 38 ATP per glucose. 
That's about a third of the energy released, and the other two-thirds of the energy will be released as heat. So again, some key features of aerobic respiration. It's the complete oxidation of glucose. An electron transport chain will be used to create a proton gradient. It requires oxygen, an aerobic environment. Oxygen will act as a terminal electron acceptor. The range of ATP production, um, 34 ATP per glucose is, is the revised new estimate of ATP production. The older estimates were between 36 and 38 ATP per glucose. And this glucose, excuse me, this ATP is, is um, produced by a combination of substrate level phosphorylation and oxidative phosphorylation. We'll see oxidative phosphorylation is the redox reactions of electron transport chain forming a proton gradient, which drives phosphorylation of ADP to ATP um, by ATP synthesis. Synthase. And because oxidative phosphorylation uses a chemical gradient to do cellular work, it's an example of what we call chemiosmosis. The end products are less toxic, the CO2 and water are less toxic than the acids and alcohols produced during fermentation. And also, folks, the intermediates um, in aerobic respiration are used in anabolic biosynthetic pathways as well. We'll come back to this, folks, um, where cellular respiration occurs. Our, um, we will focus on aerobic respiration in prokaryotic cells, bacteria cells, and the stages of aerobic respiration. The first stage, glycolysis, the enzymes are in the cytoplasm. The intermediate step that we're going to call Krebs prep, the enzymes are in the cytoplasm. The enzymes for the Krebs cycle are also in the cytoplasm. Um, however, the electron transport chain is in the cell membrane, as is ATB synthase. All right, so that's the location of all the stages of aerobic respiration in the bacterium. Later, we'll come back and describe aerobic respiration in a uh, eukaryotic cell. So again, you guys, the stages of aerobic respiration. Stage one is glycolysis. This intermediate step we'll call the Krebs prep. Stage three is the Krebs cycle. Then we'll have our electron transport chain um, using the high energy electrons harvested from glucose to form a proton gradient across a membrane. And then the protons will drive ATP synthesis by ATP synthase. And for some reason, textbooks leave out the ATP synthase and they, they're leaving out the proton gradient here. So this can be a little bit misleading. So again, the, the um, steps of aerobic respiration, and we'll go through each one. So recall you guys in glycolysis, the cell sacrifices 2 ATP to make 4 ATP, so we have a net gain of 2 ATP. Four high-energy electrons will be struck from glucose and passed to 2 NAD, making 2 reduced NADH. The 6-carbon glucose will be broken into 2 3-carbon pyruvic acids. Okay. So um, in aerobic respiration, this pyruvic acid, it still has lots and lots of high-energy electrons. So in aerobic respiration, the cell continues to rip off these high-energy electrons. So in aerobic respiration, following glycolysis, we'll have um, this, this um, second step or stage called um, what I'm calling the Krebs prep or production of acetyl-CoA. So let's take a look at that next step, the um, Krebs prep. So in the Krebs prep, we have our three carbon pyruvate. Um, we're gonna release one of the carbons as carbon dioxide. So this is called decarboxylation. We're also gonna rip off some high energy electrons and pass them to NAD to make reduced NADH. So this combination process is called oxidative decarboxylation and we're gonna see it occurring also in the Krebs cycle. So when we remove one of the carbons from pyruvic acid, we end up with this two carbon intermediate acetate. Okay, it's gonna get oxidized, and then we're gonna link a carrier molecule coenzyme A to the little two carbon um, residue. And so our another end product then is gonna be acetyl CoA. And again, it carries this these two carbons that used to be part of glucose. And it still carries high energy electrons from what used to be glucose. Now remember folks, if we um, are starting with one glucose, we'll have two pyruvic acids. So all of these end products will be doubled. Two pyruvic acids, two CO2s, two NADH, two acetyl-CoA. 
Now I know this this slide looks really busy, folks, but we'll we have a one more slide that hopefully we can explain the third stage, which is the Krebs cycle, also known as the TCA cycle for tricarboxylic acid cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle. So up here we're seeing again the Krebs prep. Here's our pyruvic acid. We have decarboxylation. We have oxidation. We have our coenzyme co A coming on board, and here's that acetyl group that used to be part of glucose still carrying high energy electrons. So to get those carbons and um, electrons from what used to be glucose into the Krebs cycle, we're going to combine the, the acetyl group with a four carbon intermediate of the Krebs cycle called oxaloacetic acid or OAA. So we're going to join the two carbons to our four carbon oxaloacetic acid. We'll get the first intermediate of the Krebs cycle called citric acid, and this is why it's sometimes called the citric acid cycle. Notice the coenzyme A, the carrier, is released. It just gets recycled. And then in a stepwise process, each of these steps is um, catalyzed by a different enzyme. Slowly, the carbon skeleton is going to get ripped apart, and the carbons will get released as carbon dioxide. And furthermore, all of the high-energy electrons are finally going to be stripped off. And the high energy electrons will be passed either to NAD to make NADH, or around here we'll see here's our second electron hydrogen um, atom carrier. The high energy electrons um, can also be transferred to FAD to make our reduced FADH2. Furthermore, indirectly, um, the cell will make one ATP molecule by substrate level phosphorylation per acetyl CoA. So for our lecture exam, we want to know the important um, end products of the Krebs cycle. So let's see if we've got a table on the next slide. Okay, here's the table, you guys, so this would be helpful to know. So one turn of the Krebs cycle, meaning per one acetyl-CoA, we're going to make two carbon dioxide, three reduced NADH, one reduced FADH2, one ATP indirectly by um, substrate level phosphorylation. And the reason the cycle is called a cycle is that original uh, acceptor molecule, oxaloacetic acid, will be regenerated. Now on the exam, if I asked you what are the end products and the number of end products per glucose, we want to remember that you're going to make two acetyl-CoA per glucose. So you're going to double the numbers of all of the end products. So per glucose, meaning um, for every 2-acetyl-CoA, we're going to release 4 CO2. That's the remaining carbons that used to be part of glucose. We'll um, produce 6 reduced NADH, 2 reduced FADH2. We'll make 2 ATP via substrate level phosphorylation, and we will regenerate <clears throat> 2 of our acceptors, our OAA, our oxaloacetic acid. And folks, this was just to, to show you why the Krebs cycle is called a cycle. It's because this original acceptor molecule, OAA, it will be regenerated, right? So this just continues in a cycle as long as acetyl-CoA is present. Just an aside, you guys, I won't ask this on the exam, but the reason that um, the Krebs cycle can be called the citric acid cycle, it's because the first um, intermediate produces citric acid, Okay. The reason it's called the tricarboxylic acid is that it is unusual in that the intermediates have three carboxyl groups, one, two, three. So tricarboxylic acid cycle. So we have our, our three carboxyl groups here and there. Okay. And again, folks, the accomplishment here is that the cell has finished oxidizing what used to be glucose. We've stripped off all of the high energy electrons, passed them either to NAD or FAD, and, and um, in that process, you guys, we've totally torn apart the carbon skeleton. So now all of the carbons that used to be part of glucose have been released as carbon dioxide. So um, up until this point, the cell has only profited, it's only uh, made, gained for ATP. So we're like, where's all the ATP? So the, um, the next events, which we, we actually talked about, you guys, in the um, in-lecture movie, is the key events of, of aerobic respiration. This is oxidative phosphorylation. And boy, did I misspell phosphorylation. Sorry, you guys. Let me see if I can correct that. Oops, that was not good. There we go. Okay, so phosphorylation. I, I can spell decently, but I cannot type. 
that you guys have discovered. Phosphorylation. Okay, so folks, oxidative phosphorylation, this is a way to make massive amounts of um, ATP. And the oxidative refers to the redox reactions of a electron transport chain. The electron transport chain is going to form a proton gradient across the membrane, and then the proton gradient is going to drive um, phosphorylation of ADP to ATP via this cool enzyme complex called ATP synthase. So that's where we're going. Now we're going to talk about the oxidative phosphorylation of aerobic respiration. And this is going to make lots and lots of ATP. This is, this is um, oxidative phosphorylation in a nutshell, you guys. This blob <laughs> represents the electron transport chains. High energy electrons will be delivered to the electron transport chain by NADH or FADH2. The electrons will be pumped from one member of the electron transport chain to the next. And we're going to say in our model that as the electrons are transferred, they lose energy. And the electron transport chain can harvest some of that energy to pump protons, hydrogen ions, from one side of the cell membrane, this side, to the opposite side. So in a bacterium, this would be the inside of the bacterium, the cytoplasm. This is the cell membrane. This is the outside of the, um, the bacterium. So the ETC is going to pump the protons from inside the cytoplasmic side of the cell membrane across to the extracellular side of the cytoplasmic membrane. Now that will create a proton gradient. We're going to have higher hydrogen ions outside than inside. So we know that's active transport pumping the substance across, excuse me, against its concentration gradient requires a membrane protein, which uh, the little um, protein proton pumping stations are part of the electron transport chains and the source of energy, because we know active transport needs more energy, is the high energy electrons that used to be part of glucose. So the redox reactions of the ETC form the proton gradient and then it's the proton gradient that will drive a massive ATP synthesis by ATP synthase. This is another um, membrane um, protein enzyme complex. And you'll see the ATP synthase has two functions. It has a water-filled um, water channel. This is a proton channel through which the hydrogen ions can flow. And as they're flowing, it's, it's almost like an electrical current, but instead of negative charges, you have positive charges. <laughs> This causes the ATP synthase to change shape. It actually spins in space. And in this process, then, the ATP synthase catalyzes formation of a new covalent bond between ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and an inorganic phosphate. So as the protons flow through ATP synthase, ATP synthase is then synthesizing ATP. Okay, so synthase. There's that ASE ending, meaning it's an enzyme. What is it doing? It's synthesizing ATP. So again, folks, ATP synthase, what is its energy source? It's that proton gradient, right? The flow of the protons. The proton gradient itself is considered a battery or potential energy. Potential energy is energy that can do work in the future. And um, as such, the proton gradient is described as the proton motive force, indicating its ability to do some work. And in bacteria, bacteria can use their proton gradients not only to drive ATP synthesis, bacteria can use their proton gradients for motility. They help, um, the proton gradient can be used to help drive rotation of bacterial flagella. And in a more complicated type of, of um, transport, the proton gradient can also drive active transport of other molecules. So it's pretty cool. You guys, on the lecture exam, if I give you a diagram of the electron transport chain and ATP synthase in the cell membrane, and I ask you which side of the membrane would have the lower pH, remember lower pH means higher hydrogen ions, it's this side that has a higher hydrogen ion concentration would have the lower pH. The op excuse me, the opposite side would have lower hydrogen ions and thus a higher pH. That's a little bit tricky, that inverse relationship. Chemiosmosis is when the cell uses chemical gradients to perform cellular work. So the proton gradient across the membrane that's used to drive ATP synthesis, this is an example of chemiosmosis. And I think it was, I think it was, was it Robert Mitchell? I can't, I can't remember his first name. But he was the one that discovered it was the proton gradient that drives ATP 
synthesis in for which he received a Nobel Prize, I believe. So it, it was referred to as chemiosmotic production of ATP. And again, folks, when you see oxidative phosphorylation, the oxidative is the redox reactions of the electron transport chain. The phosphorylation is the function of the ATP synthase that uses that proton gradient to drive ATP synthesis. Wow, this is a lot, huh? But these are questions I usually ask during the lecture. These are great questions, you guys, for the lecture exam. Um, so we'll, we'll just go from top to bottom here. Um, so we're asking formation of a proton gradient across a membrane. This forms an electrochemical gradient, the so-called proton motive force. And a proton, remember you guys, it's a hydrogen ion. And again, this acts as a battery, okay? So the protons are pumped across a membrane against their concentration gradient. Having trouble with my um, little mouse here. So let's say this is the bacterial cell membrane inside the bacterium outside. So as the electrons flow through the electron transport chain, they release energy and some of the energy is used to pump the protons across the membrane, right? High hydrogen ions, low hydrogen ions, we're pumping protons against their gradient from low to high, so that's active transport requires membrane proteins and requires a source of energy, which is the electrons that once were part of glucose. So what is the source of energy to pump protons? The answer is the electrons, right? In chemoheterotrophs, where do the high energy electrons come from? They come from our food, those preformed organic molecules like glucose. How do the high energy electrons from food reach the electron transport chain? They're carried by our little taxi cabs or our, or our little electron um, lift or Uber, the NADH and FADH2. They're the ones that will deliver the electrons to the electron transport chain. And then folks, in aerobic respiration, at the end of the electron transport chain, who will receive those electrons? Who will be the final terminal electron acceptor? In aerobic respiration, it's gonna be oxygen. Okay, and then folks, here's our beautiful ATP synthase. Um, it has a proton channel, and then it has substrate binding sites, active sites to bind ADP and inorganic phosphate. As the protons flow through the ATP synthase, that provides the energy so the ATP synthase can um, make the ATP. The protons, because they've got positive charges, they can't diffuse across the lipid bilayer of the cell membrane. Remember, they can't get across that um, hydro, um, hydro, those little hydro, hydrocarbon tails of our phospholipids. So um, they have to use then membrane proteins to move from one side of the membrane to the other. And um, let's see here. Yes, this is nice, you guys, because here we see. Um, oxygen receiving the electrons and combining with the electrons and protons to make water, right? So the reduced form of, of oxygen will be water, right? And here we see the ATP synthase is the protons are flowing through it. It's catalyzing phosphorylation of ADP to make ATP. So that's our ATP synthase. In oxidative phosphorylation, with all the electrons delivered by NADH and FADH2, we can make about 34 ATP. And remember, folks, in fermentation, we only made 2 ATP per glucose. So here, with oxidative phosphorylation, we're making 34 ATP. If we add the 2 ATP from glycolysis and the 2 ATP made in the Krebs cycle, there's a, a theoretical max of 38 ATP per glucose. The cell never achieves that, but it's a theoretical max, okay? So oxidative phosphorylation, we're going to make 34 ATP. For every NADH, enough, um, the, the electrons have enough energy to provide um, energy for pumping enough protons that we can make 3 ATP um, per NADH. And you might recall, you guys, we said in lecture that the electrons carried by FADH2 have a little bit lower energy. They're donated lower in the electron transport chain. Thus, not as many protons are pumped across. So we say per one FADH2, two ATP will be made. If we do the math, folks, if we add up all the NADH that are made, there's two made in glycolysis. There's two made in the Krebs prep per glucose. There's six made in 
um, the Krebs cycle. So let's see here, that's six and two, that's, that's 10. So 10 times three, um, 10 in NADH times three ATP per NADH, that's 30 ATP that's made with NADH. And then we have two FADH2 made in the Krebs cycle. So we go two FADH2 times two ATP per FAD, FADH2. That's four ATP. So we have 30 ATP plus four ATP. That means we have a total of 34 ATP made by oxidative phosphorylation. The ATP made in glycolysis and the Krebs cycle is made by substrate level phosphorylation. And again, folks, this is just showing the details, this so-called proton motive force. So remember the um, proton gradient across the membrane acts as a source of potential energy, a battery. So as the protons flow through, it actually causes the ATP synthase to rotate in space, to, to um, um, actually move in space. And with that proton flow, then we're going to have energy that will help drive the synthesis of ATP. And you guys, where is the electron transport chain in ATP synthase in prokaryotes and bacteria? It's in the cell membrane. And now, you guys, um, we can add a little bit more detail in your cells, in eukaryotic cells. Your electron transport chain and ATP synthase are located in your inner mitochondrial membrane. Remember the endosymbiotic theory, our mitochondria evolved from primitive bacteria? The inner mitochondrial membrane evolved from the primitive bacterial cell membrane. So it makes sense. That's where the ETC and, and ATP synthase will be located. This, not to worry you guys, um, just remember that most of the members of the electron transport chain are proteins. There's one lipid in here, but don't worry about that. Um, and then furthermore, folks, the um, another thing I would like you to remember is some of those proteins are what we call cytochromes. And remember, um, cytochromes evolved only after porphyrin rings evolved. So cytochromes were essential for evolution of ETCs and cellular respiration. These are just classic exam questions, you guys. So I'll let you answer those, okay? Some video links because students said this is a really dynamic process and we're, we're trying to show it just, you know, two-dimensional. Um, it's kind of hard to get a feeling for how beautiful and elegant it is. Um, some of these videos, you guys, they go into way, way more detail than we'll need. So the level of detail is how we're presenting it in our PowerPoint. And, and this, again, folks, sorry, this is the math, you know, so we say one NADH will indirectly help drive um, synthesis of 3 ATP, uh, one FADH2 will help drive synthesis of 2 ATP. So this is just them doing the math, you guys. Okay, from substrate level phosphorylation, oxidative phosphorylation. So the, the hypothetical maximum of 38 ATP per glucose. Now, um, for me, the concept of oxidative phosphorylation, I struggled with that a little bit. And what helped me greatly was learning about these. These are really toxins, basically. These oxidative phosphorylation uncouplers. These are artificial. And the classic one is called 2,4-dinitrophenol or 2,4-DNTP. And what 2,4-DNTP um, does, it inserts into cell membrane. So this is my cartoon, you guys. This broad blue arrow is my cartoon for 2,4-dinitrophenol. See how it's inserting into the cell membrane? We'll pretend that this is the bacterial cell membrane. And the reason that they can be toxic is they provide an alternate way for protons to, to cross the membrane. So now protons have two ways to cross the membrane. They can cross through ATP synthase to help drive ATP synthase, but now they have another way. They can cross through 2,4-DNTP. Um, and what will happen is this will basically like steal protons from ATP synthase. The more protons that pass through the 2,4-DNTP, the fewer pass through ATP synthase. The result will be a reduction in ATP synthesis. And you can imagine if you have lots and lots of 2,4-DNTP inserted in the membrane, you might have such reduction in ATP synthesis that maybe the cell will die. The reason 2,4-dinitrophenol um, is called a an oxidative phosphorylation uncoupler is, and this is a great exam question, you guys, 
um, will the function of the ETC, the electron transport chain, will that stop? And the answer is no, the electron transport chain, the redox reactions, they're continuing. Nothing's stopping them, right? So the redox reactions continue, but what's not happening, it's the phosphorylation of the ATP that's decreasing. And thus, we say the 2,4-dinitrophenol, it's uncoupling this, the redox reaction, the oxidation reactions of the ETC from the function, and that is to help drive um, phosphorylation of ADP to ATP. So we're uncoupling ETC function from the function of the ATP synthase. Your former colleagues have shared with me that in, at least historically, in some of the weight loss products, this is what they would put in to the weight loss product, or this, these oxidative phosphorylation uncouplers. And my gosh, you guys, it seems to me that that could be potentially toxic, right? If somebody took so much they were really reducing their ATP production. It seemed to me that that could be potentially toxic. Another thing I'll ask you folks on the um, lecture exam two is about electron transport chain inhibitors. Don't worry about this coenzyme Q inhibitor. What I'd like you to know are the cytochrome inhibitors. And again, that one is misspelled, sorry. Um, so the cytochrome inhibitors, I think a lot of you have an instinct for the cytochrome inhibitors. At least you know that they're toxic. And the ones that um, probably you're already aware of, you know that they're toxic cyanide, hydrogen sulfide, and carbon monoxide. So these substances bind to the cytochromes. And here are the cytochromes, you guys. The abbreviation is CYT, cytochrome, 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 cytochrome. When they bind to the cytochromes, they block electron transport. They're like a roadblock for electron transport. So with the cytochrome inhibitors, the whole electron transport chain shuts down. It stops. The electrons are not flowing anymore. And if the electrons aren't flowing, protons aren't being pumped. So eventually, the um, proton gradient, it dissipates because protons will flow across through the ATP synthase and eventually there'll be an equal concentration of protons inside as outside, so you've lost your gradient. And that means that ATP synthesis will be reduced. And that's one reason we die when we're exposed to cyanide, hydrogen sulfide, or carbon monoxide. Shuts down our ETCs and therefore it shuts down the ATP synthase. So folks, we're just going to do a tiny, tiny bit on a more primitive type of cellular respiration. This was the first type of cellular respiration to evolve in prokaryotes. This is why you don't hear about it in human ANP. So anaerobic respiration is microbiologist, folks. It's important that in micro, whenever you see respiration, we know there's an electron transport chain involved. And the first part um, describes what will be the final, the terminal electron acceptor. So in anaerobic respiration, it means without air, without oxygen, we know that there's no O2, right? It's anaerobic, there's um, molecular oxygen will not be the terminal electron acceptor. We're going to use a different type of electron transport chain. The ATP, ATP yield will be less than with aerobic respiration. It'll be more than with fermentation, but less than with aerobic respiration. So the, the two alternate terminal electron acceptors I'd like you to know for anaerobic respiration are nitrates. So nitrates can act as alternate terminal electron acceptors at the end of the ETC. And these nitrates, you guys, they can be reduced all the way to molecular nitrogen. And we'll see this is an important part of the um, nitrogen cycle. Another alternate uh, terminal electron acceptor are sulfates. And sulfates can be reduced all the way to hydrogen cyanide. And, I said that wrong, you guys. Sulfates can be reduced to hydrogen sulfide. And again, you guys remember, this is toxic. Their cytochrome inhibitors shut down the electron transport chain. Hydrogen sulfide has the uh, aroma of rotten eggs. And often you'll smell the hydrogen sulfide in water, uh, water log, water-saturated soils. Such soils are anaerobic, and so it forces the soil microbes to switch to anaerobic respiration. So if there's sulfates in the soils, the microbes will start making hydrogen sulfide, and that's why swamps and marshes smell kind of like rotten eggs. Folks, um, we, I won't ask about um, CO2 or carbonates as alternate electron acceptors. It is important. I should talk about it because 
In this case, you'll end up making methane, and methane is a real powerful greenhouse gas, right? So we should have a whole, really a whole lecture on the impact of microbes on global climate change. But again, you guys, um, for right now, we can, we can skip this little guy. What's amazing is some bacteria, like E. coli, they can carry out fermentation, they can carry out aerobic respiration, and they can carry out anaerobic respiration. So we want to remember some of our microbes are really, really um, flexible. Here's some, um, again, again, folks, um, we all, we're we only going to worry about nitrate as an alternate terminal electron acceptor, and then sulfates right here. Okay. Um, let me see here. We will be in lab doing metabolic test biochemical tests to detect anaerobic respiration. Um, and for example, the production of, of um, hydrogen sulfide in one of our tests. On the lecture exams, you know we love to ask you to compare and contrast different processes. So I, I included this table, you guys. I thought it might be a nice maybe study guide for um, our lecture exam to comparing aerobic respiration to anaerobic respiration to fermentation. And um, again, folks, we want to go over where in um, cellular respiration, where each of the stages of aerobic respiration occurs. So you guys remember, oops, dog on it. Um, in bacteria, the enzymes for glycolysis, the Krebs prep, and the Krebs cycle are all in the cytoplasm, and the electron transport chain and ATP synthase are in the cell membrane. Now, in um, eukaryotes, like human cells, the um, enzymes for glycolysis are in our cytoplasm, but all the other stages, you guys, occur in our mitochondria, and remember, the mitochondria are evolved from primitive bacteria, so the Krebs prep enzymes, well, just to simplify this, you guys will say it's on the inside of the mitochondrion in what's called the matrix. The matrix evolved from the primitive bacterial cytoplasm. Likewise, the enzymes for the Krebs cycle are in the inside of the mitochondria in the mitochondrial matrix. The electron transport chain is embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And remember, that's what evolved from the primitive cell membrane and why they always leave out ATP synthase, I don't know. It's a mystery to me. But ATP synthase would also be embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. When the e ETC is active, um, the ETC is functioning, electrons are flowing. The ETC is pumping protons from the matrix, the inside of the mitochondrion, across the inner mitochondrial membrane into this inner membrane space, this intermembrane space. And then they're going to flow back across the inner mitochondrial membrane through ATP synthase back into the matrix. This is just to remind me, to remind you all, that even though we've only focused on glucose as a high-energy electron donor, other sugars can be used as high-energy electron do donors. Lipids, fats can be used. Proteins, amino acids can be used. They get fed in at different points in the stages of aerobic respiration. But... Um, organic molecules other than glucose can act as sources of high-energy electrons. And this is just to remind me to remind you all that we're not talking about how the intermediates of aerobic respiration can be used for biosynthesis and anabolism. So they can be used to make carbohydrates, amino acids, lipids, and in addition, Krebs cycle intermediates can be used to make the nitrogenous bases um, for DNA and RNA, right? And we just, we don't have enough time, unfortunately. Hopefully in A&P, you do more on anabolism biosynthesis. And again, folks, this is just showing kind of the, um, a lot of these, you can see we have double-headed arrows. So we can have catabolic processes occurring, but then we can drive them in reverse for anabolic processes. So it's, it's really beautifully integrated, anabolism and catabolism. And folks, I think what I'll do here is I'm going to stop. We'll call this Metabolism PowerPoint B Part 2. And then eventually, within the next few days, I'll do uh, Metabolism PowerPoint B Part 3, where we'll talk really, really quickly about photosynthesis. And then, again, really quickly, you guys will talk about the nitrogen cycle. So we'll, we'll close for now on this one.